Back in the Neolithic age of 1996, a silver medal winning corpse party would give birth to a new genre, RPG Maker Horror. Featured in this genre are several horror icons such as Ao Oni, or Yume Neki, or Amori, or the one we were all thinking of, Kanye Quest. The possibilities of what you can do are truly endless. You want to see a school full of high school kids get horrifically maimed? Go for it. Want to have your heart ripped out in an emotionally draining adventure through trauma and fear? Okay. Want to run from these deliciously voluptuous naked purple men? Here you go. The point is, this genre has some real glittering stars of psychological horror, and I would dare say, in my totally unbiased and unwaveringly correct opinion, some of the best horror media out there. Enter me. Still a newbie to the genre, but so willing to learn, I sought to become a planet-leading master on the subject of RPG Maker Horror. To do so, I played and completed five well-known games, kind of, in one week. Because as we all know, experiencing five things related to one topic makes you a hardened expert on said topic. One thing you might know about me, besides canonically being three feet tall, I really hate a good story, which is my awful segue of choice into our first subject of the video. It is with sheer anger and hatred that I introduce to you, Mad Father. Released on December 10th, 2012, Mad Father follows the story of a girl named Aya, who is collateral in the atrocities of her father. The game begins with Aya having watched too many I'm J Station 3AM videos running to her father. Hey, why does he have a better hairline than me? Father is a dubious little creature doing mischief, cheating on his wife and also murdering homeless orphans with nowhere else to go. You know, neurodivergent activities. Also jump scared by the way. And no, I will not ease up on random withered foxy jump scares because they're funny. Also, with the full context, Jesus Christ, is this frame genuinely haunting. If you know, you know, and if you don't know, keep watching. Stupid. It's the anniversary of your mom's death, and immediately the game title proves to be true, because you've got to have absolutely fucking lost it if you're going to cheat on this. For more context, the father cheated on the mother with his servant and mistress, Maria. Or Maria. Who cares? Snowball, the family pet, is here too. How adorable. Eventually, the hour rolls over, over to midnight, the anniversary of mom's death. And with the sound of a grandfather clock, everything becomes cold. This game is full of flashbacks, mostly used to make you feel awful because things were once so nice, but are now awful. Through those, we learn that mom had tuberculosis. Kovac! And was about to pull a Red Dead Redemption 2 reference. Spoiler, by the way. Ah. Ah. That was so scary. We're woken up by an incredibly masculine scream, and now it's all up to this prepubescent girl to walk into an active war zone. Two well-dressed zombies hobble up on us, all stitched together, and we get lured away. Golden Hair Boy gives us an easy out of the video game, which we refuse because he doesn't have his swag straight, and Aya flees to a bald man. Lore happens, we save at a crow, and then the game officially begins. Mad Father is a survival horror game. And like all survival horror games, you get an item that does something, then you use that item to get into another area to find more items that also do something. Kinda like that one game with the funny bird, but unlike the game with the funny bird, this game doesn't make me want to beat my infant son out of anger. Something unique to this game, at least to set it apart from other RPG Maker horror games, is that if you get caught or put into a treacherous situation, you can save yourself through the timely execution of a sequence of buttons, which is virgin for a quick time event. Now, I don't want to waste your time with this video, but more importantly, I don't want to waste my time with this video. Since it's most likely going to be over an hour long because we have five games featured, and I'm guessing you, the viewer, are going to be watching this over the span of multiple days, I'm going to be focusing on the big pull of each game, and for Mad Father, that would no doubt be the story. Every flashback sequence has a way of tying back into the main story, some of them being resolved during gameplay. One such example is Snowball the Rabbit disappearing with a wounded leg, but reappearing soon after, fully healed. Wondering what happened? Come back in 10 minutes. The Drevis family are evidently huge fans of dolls. Dolls are everywhere. Aya has one. They sit on benches and trip you when you walk by. There's a room full of them that is definitely one of the most cursed rooms in the game. They can bleed, they can kill, and they can hunt you. And yes, these two are dolls. It's weird though. They seem so realistic. Puzzles happen and we make it into the archive room where we get shown exactly what the father does. Testing out narcotics on literal children. Look, this one's begging for their mom. How distressing. 
we learn that the father's affair is a pretty terribly kept secret, and the mother held some resentment towards him before the incident. We also get to play a Snowball the Rabbit in this game, and despite all odds, nothing bad happens to him. Thumbnail image, and we burn a pile of dead-ish babies. Mario's having a skill issue and mentions Aya's mother, but before she gets the chance to explain, she gets hotfixed out of the story for a quarter of the runtime. Ogre makes an appearance to be bald, and what the- Mom? Yoinked Papa? And took him to the mom dimension? Aya's mom held nothing but pure, unbridled hatred toward her husband, which is completely understandable, by the way. That hate transformed into a curse that swallowed the mansion and even the grounds around it. Then this 11-year-old girl gets a chainsaw. Not really sure how she wields it so effortlessly and doesn't hurt herself. If I had to guess, Aya's mom in her life was an incredibly buff lumberjack and she passed down those skills to her daughter. The lower parts of the Drevis Manor is full of dolls and souls that need help. This blonde doll is missing her eyes, this severed head is missing his body, and this mute ghost girl wants to go home. So Aya does her best to help them, essentially righting her own father's wrongs and doing good by the spirits, letting them rest. Occasionally, by helping some of these dolls, you get a vision of what happened at their demise. This mute girl, for example, died to a chainsaw. After hate criming the less fortunate, we get a zooming shot of the father laughing maniacally. And this is a very subtle, extremely vague, incredibly missable nod to the fact that the father is just a little bit completely insane. Perhaps belonging on some kind of registry too, but I'll save that one for the twit longer. The further down you go, the more dangerous and vengeful the spirits become, including labyrinths of dolls that'll impale you the moment you fail a quick time event. Things also get much more sci-fi. Remember Snowball, who disappeared with a wounded leg and reappeared perfectly healthy? Me neither. Oh wait, there he is. The doctor put him in a jar. How unenviable. I like this reveal. The reveal that Snowball has been replaced seemingly dozens of times. It's so good because it's completely missable unless you interact with the jars. Also, I have to ask, is the father cloning Snowballs? I feel like Aya would know if it's not the same exact rabbit, even if they look similar. Also, there's just straight up an orc in this game. Yeah, so apparently the curse not only brings back the vengeful dead, but it also brought over some fantastical creatures. And if the theming of the game wasn't confusing enough, Welcome to church. Ogre sits there in the pew, watching Aya give a sermon. In the beginning, there was an egg. For aeons, the egg sat dormant, eternity weighing hard on its shell. The egg grew frustrated. In its multitudes, it grew weary of the vast nothingness that lay before it. From it, a river flew. The river of time. A cosmic flow that devoured nothing. The egg noticed that without a medium, time couldn't move. So it invented a new concept, space. The egg crafted matter from oblivion. The architect of hundreds of millions of billions of galaxies, souls, stars. It planted the seeds of reality. A new dawn. I may be an 11 year old girl, but with every breath I draw, I am reminded that I'm just one infinitesimally small piece of the egg's infinite reach. A machine that was built out of nothing. A river without a source, a light with no shadows, a story with no end. The truth is, the events of tonight haven't fazed me and never will, for I know that my thoughts, my feelings are organic. They're immature. They'll be erased without prejudice within the next century. None of it matters. Only one thing does. One day the egg will hatch, and only then may we know the true meaning of this all. What the fuck? One of my big questions that I want to know is how does the family make money? And the only thing I can really come up with is organ farming. Think about it. The father cuts up people to turn them into dolls. What does he do with all the organs and stuff that we don't see externally? He either keeps them for study or sells them off. I mean, I guess he could be feeding them to his daughter. No wonder I is so hench. We're then scripted to get picked up by some dude and raptured into the heavens. But with careful button presses, you can defy God and damn everyone to an eternity of suffering. You fool. Flashback and cute blonde anime boy is there to try and riz up Aya, but unfortunately she is really stupid. Then Mari appears with a plan to rescue the doctor from Mad Mother. Mad Father cutscene where he hugs an orphan boy from behind, and we get to see a little bit about the boy's origin. He was taken into the family with the promise of being adopted, but on second thought, 
No, that's too wholesome. The game has this very interesting segment where it tells the story of what I think is the father's upbringing in a really cool way where you like play out what's happening. As a boy, the father killed animals for fun and quickly grew addicted. Like every psychopath, this boy got a start on animals and later graduates to humans. His stupid mom got upset, so he killed her. That's what you get, mom, you don't understand me. He fled overseas to escape his crime, but still remembered how pretty his mother's dead face was. So he did the same thing to random strangers. Jump scare, by the way. And Aya's kill count is now at one. A little rat girl steals your perfume and somehow manages to noiselessly board it up in this little cubby hole next to this knife crime doll. Something Mad Father is really good at is show don't tell. This room, for example, showing the history of the Drevis family. At one point they were royalty, they were engineers, they were showmen. This one hanged herself. They were whimsical little forest creatures. And this one represents today a cell to hold unwanted people. Following this is a homicidal doll with an axe and a winning smile. This doll is incredibly fast and incredibly aggressive, with the intended solution to getting past it being to trap it inside the cell. And I didn't realize until I saw it standing in the cell that, like the dolls in the prior displays, this doll is also supposed to represent the Drevis family. This doll represents the father, and I just think that's so cool. You're close now. All that's left to do is dispose of this doll spirit keeping you away from father. The halls that follow are crawling with killer dolls, so you have a little stealth mission you have to do first. Through a vision, we get to see that the rat girl was told that she'd be Aya's big sister, even holding baby Aya at some point. But unfortunately, we all know how that one ended. Going back to the fantastical creatures thing, mandrakes here are used to scream and kill everything that listens. So the intended solution is to play the crane game and dig out a key out of the dog's stomach. Then there's the furnace room, which is, I think a more accurate term to describe it would be the hole down to hell. Aya's favorite doll returns all shadow in a last ditch effort to convince Aya that her father isn't worth saving, but Aya is too young and too dense to listen. Ogre appears one final time to give Aya a tool, fizzy sparkling water, a drink that evokes the same sensation as seeing a bald person in real life. This is your last chance to go back and collect gems still hidden, or following a man with sad eyes to read a certain someone's diary. Jumping through the portal, you're taken to the mom dimension. The mom dimension is a dark void with portals and these diamond-shaped crystal pathways. And then there's mom. You have a sick debate that makes me want to chug a dishwasher detergent because mom is sick of dad's shit and is planning on permanently kidnapping him to the mom dimension, which is completely fair. We don't like this dude. I hate him. Not because he's the embodiment of a mad scientist that subjects innocent helpless victims to horrors beyond their own understanding, but because he has to be at least in his 30s and he has a better hairline than me at 20. Go think about what you did. Unfortunately, if you didn't backtrack when Ogre let you the final time, you're locked into one of the bad endings. Letting Dad go to the mom dimension will give you the first one. You're brought back to an Iron Maiden with torrential blood is spilling out of the cracks. Nothing important, don't worry. Aya holds a sermon with Maria as the congregation, but Aya told Maria she has to go home. Maria doesn't have a home and the doctor paid her an eyeball so she can't go anywhere. Instead, she decides to just continue where father left off. Her first work, Aya. Going back, if we choose to save title card, we get an unsurprisingly even worse ending. Mad Mother appears from the curtain and decides to show Aya the truth. The full truth. We get taken back to the same cutscene that we started off the game with. Only instead of fading to black, we get the full context. Be my most precious doll of them all. What? What? A doll? Me? Father, you'll never make our precious daughter into one of your subjects. Mad Mother saw all of this, hence this frame foreshadowing it from the beginning. We get some pretty revolting dialogue talking about how Aya is becoming ripe, which is eh. Mother is a bit upsetty spaghetti. I would be too if I heard this insanity. She went in there to try and end his plans, but when that didn't work, she decided she'd leave and take Aya with her. But as they said somewhere in the Old Testament, Hose is a little bit mad. And Mad Father stabs Mad Mother. Then, snap back to reality, Father backs Aya into the curtains, doing a pretty sick reveal. The thing that was pooling out of the Iron Maiden was your own dear mom's blood. How wholesome. Then Aya utters the holy phrase, Fifth! causing Mad Father to grow eyes. It's a miracle, truly. Now it's time to escape from Mad Father, armed with a chainsaw and ready to operate on your ripened self. <laughs> Ew. 
why did I put that in the script? And as you run, some dolls seem to be trying to help uh, Aya yeah. get away from her father. Ghosts clearly haven't studied the matchup though, because Chainsaw always beats Corpse. The mother's curse is here to try and protect Aya, even now that she went back to the mom dimension. Mad Father hits a critical hit on Maria and knocks her out, and you continue your escape. Jump scare, by the way. Some dolls brought back by the curse aren't so keen on being helpful to Aya, however. Some want to drag her down with them, and unfortunately, if you didn't get the key to Maria's room earlier, there's nothing you can do. Aya gets nay-nayed, and we get the most upsetting scene in the game. Oh my god, that's awful. He's finally made the perfect doll. But what if you did do all your chores? What if you ate all your dinner and finished your homework? Then what? Go find the spot Maria collapsed, pick up the key to her room, go to her room on the first floor of the East Wing, and read her diary. You'll get a sequence explaining Maria's backstory. She too was a starving vagrant that the doctor was looking to experiment on. But when he found out she had medical skills, he instead invited her to become his lab assistant. Bro, how does this lunatic keep pulling these tens? What the fuck? Because Aya read that, she is now an expert in the medical field. Go do the Aya doll ending, and when Maria gets floored, treat her. You'll now leave together. At least until she eats it. The spooky bitch reappears to try and drag down Aya again, and Aya meets another peaceful end. I love you. I uh, yeah. I love you, Aya. Yeah, father gets scalpeled by Maria, and so does the doll. And then we get an adorable scene of two traumatized girls. Oh wait, after what feels like the 90th plot twist in the last five minutes, blonde anime boy puts a window into father's skull via pickaxe. How wholesome. Aya, Maria, and Snowball leave, leaving the burning mansion and the strange blonde anime boy behind. She finds a copy of George Orwell's 1984 on the ground afterward. Afterward, and started six multi-billion dollar corporations. Oh wait, no. What actually happens is she became a doctor following in her father's footsteps. How regrettable. Okay, so what I think happened was the mysterious book she picked up was her father's lab notes, or perhaps a book on anatomy, and maybe that gave her the idea to become a doctor like her father. Whether she became batshit insane or not is anyone's guess. There's a shelf covered in dolls, but they don't seem to be the same full-size ones that Mad Father had. So it's probably not anything bad. Well, at least that's what I had hoped until I played Blood Mode. Blood Mode starts with an adult Aya accepting candy from a complete stranger, and it sends her on a nasty trip. Now, adult Aya is navigating the mansion, and things are different. Ogre welcomes her back, talking like he knew everything that's happened, before disappearing into thin air. So, that's cool. We got some pretty heavy lore dumped on us. It starts off with the vision of Aya holding a bird that she hurt, being scolded by her dad. Throughout, we find diary entries that contextualize things, and while this isn't that important to mention, I'd like to talk about this human doll that got revenge on this baby doll that killed her in the main game. She must be a huge fan of the hit game Amori because she immediately follows it up by trying to push Aya down the stairs. In the library, we get some context behind the house itself, too. It seems this place was owned by some kind of religious cult, which would explain the religious imagery across the mansion. The book talks about creating eternal beauty, something the father seems all too familiar with but the group is shriveling up. Apparently, there's not that many people left that are crazy enough to want to turn people into dolls. After getting through the rooms that explain Papa's backstory, we get to the pivotal room that confirm our fears. Jean Rooney, the girl that appeared at the end of the main game, appears. She attacks Aya in an attempt to drown her here in blood mode. Her spirit can also be seen following Aya as she goes, writing cute poems for her to read, such as Murderer. Yep, that's right. Despite my hopes to the contrary, Aya Drevis is a murderer. A doctor that lures in those less fortunate and immortalizes them in doll form. She is her father's daughter. Interestingly, we're given a fairly human note from the father. Well, as human as this could be. The father sees that Aya was just like him, killing animals for fun and hiding them. And not only that, but her mother is encouraging her. He doesn't want that to happen. He doesn't want his daughter to grow up a killer. So he decided that she will be immortalized as a doll with no human blood on her hands. So now it's pretty much confirmed that it's not only the father that's batshit insane, but it's also the mother and even Aya, the protagonist. This kind of thing must run in the family, huh? Ratgirl returns as a doll that gives you a look, and the game does me a real one in letting me skip this tile moving puzzle. Similar to the father backstory on the chair that sat the creepy doll is now a book that gives you some insight on the mother's past. She's one of those that write love letters to serial killers, which, you know, that alone should explain a lot. But not only is she stupid, 
She's not exactly clean either, inheriting the Drevis family home from her grandfather. The grandfather being the guy that coped about how the cult was losing believers. So the mother, Monica Drevis, raised Aya to wind up just like her father. Someone that could continue the family's lineage. She wanted a monster. In the next room we see a love letter, presumably to Alfred Drevis, Aya's father. She is obsessed with him. A serial killer obsessed with the beauty of death that spared her life. Essentially the perfect successor to her grandfather's work. The man himself is now up on stage among all his beautiful creations. Has he changed a lot since you've last met? Nope. Aya's forehead grew three sizes that day and she accepts whatever painful biting death awaits. Aya just wants to be with her mom and dad now. They can all be insane out there in the mom dimension. Aya counters Alfred with a hug at the cost of having her forehead permanently that size, and we get a rare human moment from him. Until the trip ends. So, uh, yeah, that was blood mode. It does well to contextualize some weird things Aya says in the game. It also paints her comment about Jean's eyes in a far darker light. But wait, we're not done with part one of this quintuple feature yet because we still got if mode, unlocked by getting every gem in the main game. If you get every gem in the game, you'll unlock a new ending where Ogre nabs dear old dad and takes him to the Ogre dimension. Alfred is now hunched in purple, his gaze fixated on a clone of his daughter in a tank. After this, you can load up a new game and go to if mode. It's the ending again, but now from the perspective of the blonde boy. It isn't very long, it's just four more conversations that do well to breathe life into the story. Somehow the mother has the least interesting thing to say, telling him to say goodbye to Aya in her place, which he did exactly how she would have done, through a good luck charm that we read about in Blood Mode. Taking a nice warm bloodbath is some old guy talking about how his life in servitude to Monica Drevis was terrible. We could find him in the main game in a cell to himself, muttering about how dangerous the mother is. Here he says that he tried to escape, but that action cost him his life. He believes that Monica brainwashed her husband into becoming the perfect successor to the Drevis family's rituals. And finally, and by far more interestingly, we get Ogre, a stranger with red eyes, potentially the same one that the book at the beginning mentioned. The book that started everything the moment you interacted with it. Editor Peg here. So rewatching the footage, this stranger with red eyes was also mentioned in another place. In a story where someone named Jack seemed to be trying to get revenge on someone by cursing them, it would seem that this red-eyed stranger takes deals from people with grudges to get revenge on someone by cursing them. Now this is pure speculation here, but what I think happened was Monica Drevis, Mad Mother, went to Ogre, the stranger with red eyes, to curse Alfred Drevis and try and take him to the mom dimension with her. Again, pure speculation. There's no concrete proof that Ogre is this person, but it, it, it's, come on. He came here to entertain himself and is obviously not an ordinary human. If I had to guess with him teleporting around and activating Ultra Instinct, he's some kind of demon that enjoys watching people suffer through unholy trials and tribulations. He tells our boy Goldilocks to put an end to all the mad men in the world and then instant transmissions away. Then we get to see the mansion burning scene only from the boy's perspective, as it would turn out, he was never dead. He was never a corpse. He was a living person on a mission to rescue Aya from her father. We get one final dialogue between him and Aya's favorite doll, where the doll asks what he'd do if Aya turned out like her father, which she did. And the boy answers saying he'd try to stop her. You heard it here first, folks. Join me the next time for Mad Daughter! Now that Aya's story is most certainly done and behind us, never to be brought up again or thought about again, let's take a look at the next game in this quintuple feature. The Witch's House is an interesting one. It has its own manga adaptation, which I think is just so cool to see someone's creative work get turned into something bigger. Genuinely love to see it. It also features so many ways to meet your untimely demise, it would make Mad Father blush. Here's a clip of me entering the very first room. Haha, <laughs> whoops. This section is going to be a little different than the Mad Father section because unlike Mad Father, which was incredibly story centric, Witch's House is far more gameplay centric. You are a blonde girl named Viola. Viola is a little scoundrel that went and disobeyed her father's orders. 
going to a witch's house in the woods. It seems though that when Viola arrived, a large barrier of thorny rose bushes surrounded the perimeter of the house. And you know what they say, all toasters toast toast. What follows is about two hours straight of puzzle solving, each puzzle being incredibly well designed and original. The deaths are fun, and speaking of the deaths, there are a lot of them. I'd estimate a solid 800 ways to get to the pearly gates per room, so have fun with that one. Sauntering about the place is a strange, eyeless, purple-haired girl with a big bow. Presumably the witch. You're not allowed to interact with her until the end of the story. Here in this bookshelf, we can get some lore surrounding the strange house that Viola finds herself in. This one states that key, bad. Puzzle, good. This one states that the witch's magic is what's causing the house to change form, and if I had to guess, caused it to be laden with traps too. Then there's a funny story, containing a funny story. Rich man had a cart that broke, hunter and dog guarded it. Mom is sick, hunter went home, dog stayed put because he's a good boy. Rich man gave the good boy the good boy reward in one shiny quarter. The good boy went home to give master the coin, but the master has critical thinking skills and discern that the dog by the cart stole from the cart. So the master did what any good pet owner should do, and shot Fido. Wait, what do you mean that wasn't funny? A fictional dog inside an already fictional universe is dead. May he rest in peace. Dude, that story was so unfunny. Look what you did! Upstairs is the world's sickest pillow fort, and I get to see my first glimpse at female sleepover activities. Ah uh, yes, I still remember my first dagger in the appendix. Then we get to meet everybody's favorite character, Bartolo the Frog, who's looking for home. He's the only friendly face in the game, treasure him like he's your son. Something that these games do a lot of is censor words with either X's or question marks, and the witch's house is no exception. I'm like 99% certain that this word is supposed to be death. But maybe our darling Viola is too innocent to have ever encountered that word. Welcome to the Troll Corridor. Here's the trauma door, something serpentine is behind it. But wait, there's nothing there, what are you supposed to- I'm sorry, there's no other way. If I had the option to choose, I'd offer myself as a sacrifice in your place, and believe me, I wish there was another way, but- But there isn't. I hope whatever you do, hopefully, you'll be able to find home. Wait, maybe I could have gone back to grab the fake frog. Anyways, here's a really cool room where you're supposed to find a face where only one eye is open. You think that you're supposed to step into one of these mouths, right? But you're actually supposed to step right here, where one eye is closed and one eye is open. Eh? Isn't that cool? Sorry, I'm trying to be optimistic, but Bartolo's loss really shook me to my core. This next puzzle is most definitely my favorite. You're supposed to make sounds in four rooms. Yeah. Viola looks a little under the weather, huh? Just be prepared to get quick scope the second you leave the room. Simultaneously, one of the scariest and funniest deaths is at the hand of this black-haired painted lady. She chases you down at mock speed. Her face becomes all freaky in a genuinely terrifying bit, and then boom, painting. If you juke her out for long enough, she gets fed up and rushes Viola down, leaving Viola painting in a much more brutal tone. After this, something really interesting happens, which makes absolutely zero sense on your first playthrough. The purple-haired girl leaps out of a painting and lunges for Viola, but to her defense comes... the purple-haired girl? This is one of those things that on a second playthrough you point at and go, Whoa! I get it! The next room is... Ah! Grass! I'm sorry guys, I gotta end the video, I hope you understand. You're gonna be in this area for a while. I was stuck here for approximately half the playthrough. This area features a logic puzzle with talking plants, the red lie, the white gets plucked, and the yellow all conspired to commit murder at the dinner table. In this pool is Bartolo's spawn. They all know it was your fault, so they tie center blocks to your ankles and drown you. And it's deserved too. After writing a eulogy for Bartolo, you help fuel an addict's ketamine addiction and you get an ominous message. Let them bleed. The shoes are red, which is not right. So you wash them off in the tadpole's home, killing them all. You not only selfishly murdered a little guy in cold blood, but you also set fire to his branch of the family tree. You did that. You. Further into the house, we get another entry of the witch's diary, stating that Viola is supposed to end her sickness. After finding the purple doll, you get a note saying to come to someone's room. And your save kitty is dead now, Rip. Now in the witch's room, the final entry states that the witch is going to take Viola's body, take her body and live on in it, because they're friends. Then a legless purple-haired girl appears from the mirror. 
Wow, cool metaphor. And says, gee. Viola is a total bitch, so she runs away. The house doing everything it can to slow her down, but Viola is simply too good. And hey, I thought it was daytime. You find a note that completes your note lying on the ground. It was all in your head. You're in a coma going on a magical adventure or something like that. But wait, the witch is still chasing you. Poor innocent Viola. Dad blows her head wide open, then follows it up with another shot. Then that's the end of the game. Just kidding, that's the bad end. If during the witch chase you run past the door and instead go to this room right here, you can get Ellen's knife. Ellen being the purple haired witch. Doing so will end the game with Viola herself coldly attacking the witch with her knife. We then get the crazy reveal. We, Viola, are the witch. We were playing as the witch the whole time. Ellen the witch already stole Viola's body, leaving Viola in Ellen's dying legless body. But Viola is too worried about her father to die. A single father raising his only daughter whom he ironically killed in defense of what he thought was his daughter. How wholesome. So yeah, that's the story of the witch's house. If you beat the game and get the true ending, you'll unlock extra mode, something that completely remixes every single puzzle present in the main game. Besides entirely new puzzles, it also features evil Bartolo, backtracking, a chef chase, and most importantly, the funny story is actually funny. <laughs> Like Blood Mode in Angry Sire, the second mode is full of lore. It goes into the witch's backstory, how she was severely neglected as a child, how she made a pact with a demon taking the form of a black cat that turned her into a witch, and how lonely she is despite it all. Also, this viola chase took me like 90 tries to do correctly because there's blood spatters that just start spawning in, and you have to trial and error it until you memorize the locations of each spatter. So that's fun. The ending's not really changed though, so you, you'll be fine. You don't need to subject yourself to more witches' house unless you're a big fan of watching children die, at which point I'd refer you over to law enforcement because you might need to be psychoanalyzed. There is no ending where you get your body back, so that's unfortunate, but uh... Oh well. If you stand still and wait for an hour, the roses will eventually disappear, implying that regardless of whether you actually played the game or not, the witch's magic would inevitably fade. I swear, the only positive ending in this game is being caught by Viola. I don't know if Viola finds a way to get her body back when doing so or if she just murders Ellen out of spite, but regardless, man, this just sucks. Can we get a game that's not so dark? Unlike The Witch's House, Stray Cat Crossing is almost entirely story driven, with much simpler but still intuitive puzzles. From what I can gather, Stray Cat Crossing is the least known about, and the reasoning behind that I can only assume is because our protagonist here sports the most abominable fit that has ever disgraced my photoreceptors. I think it's the vest. I'd sooner take my chances sprinting across that 50 lane highway in Beijing than risk getting infected with this minus two drip. Huh, now that I think about it, it's kind of growing on me. No! Get out of my head, 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 get out of my head. The other thing I noticed through my playthrough of this game, besides this atrocity, is that Stray Cat Crossing is actually really good. So let's start from the beginning. You find a random cat named Girl in the middle of the road and you walk her back to her home, walking right down the center line for some reason. Girl nabs nameless MC's scarf so MC breaks and enters to get it back. From there, hijinks ensue. Downstairs is the first area to complete, having these two jovial baby-faced morons and the most hideous English bulldog the world has ever seen. We do an epic reference and MC starts seeing some crazy things. Yep. Stray Cat Crossing is one of those artsy fartsy games. Just look at this nutcracker begging for nuts. We get an actually really cool, really adorable animation that is also incredibly uncanny. It looks like the baby head leaps from body to body and the face it leaps from becomes this disgusting angry baby face. Ew. More puzzles happen in the baby basement. Then we get told press L shift to run and have the option to save the game. I wonder what's gonna happen. There's this pretty horrible scene of a hanged fetus, wondering why you abandoned it. Then we get a chase scene by a giant baby monster. The implications here are very awful. Also something that I really love is that if you get caught, it ends like a film instead of just a death, which I think is really cool considering uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get there, we'll get there. Whatever it was begs for you to remember it. And you find Girl talking about how her parents didn't want her. According to Girl, they were having twins and didn't want her anymore, so she left. They all ended up dying and the twins are mad at her. 
she killed them. The next area is out in the back, featuring an owl, a giant clog, and this disgusting grub lady. She asks for her spawn, which you can find over caught in the spider web. Watch out though, this conjoined quadruple wolf spider, each with seasonal names, is going to eat you. Why is the wolf spider named after the four seasons? Good question. Anyways, they want to stop being conjoined because they really can't stand each other and send you to the west to meet the sphinx. Going to the sp <laughs> Sorry. This conversation starter implies that they've met before. Wouldn't that be something? The woman already knows what MC is here for and will grant your request in return for a red larva, which can be found in the hedge maze. So go through a maze to find the larva to bring to the woman, to free the wolves, to get the dude, to get answers from giant grub lady. I hope you like fetch quests. Weirdly in the lost woods, <clears throat> excuse me, in the maze, you can find a sign by someone coping about their terminal illness. Then there's a feisty little dude that doesn't want you to get past. The answer to his riddle is mother, by the way. Then you have a logic puzzle to do with the grand prize being that red larva that the woman wants for nefarious reasons. God, she's so damaged, but also so French, I need her. Once that happens, you can sing a love song for the wolves and they're separated. Huh. That's unfortunate. Turns out the little grub guy was just trolling and you're back to square one. Not actually though. Not actually though. While you progress through this area, the big grub lady cocooned and became a beautiful butterfly. And there she is. I think. The bug lady is asking for cat. Which you totally aren't, by the way. Girl appears again and asks MC for her name. Her name being... Cat. The third and final area is in the attic, and immediately you're greeted by this incredibly jovial man. His excitement is almost palpable. Before you are rows of coffins that you can check and potentially loot, as any hot dog grilling God-fearing red-blooded American should do. Also, camera guy has a dog now. How whimsical. I have... Pretty mixed feelings about the puzzles in this section since it's just looping, starting over and grabbing the same stuff again to do more. Mad Garden of Banban -Ban vibes. The only thing of note here are this angry guy and the story. They're doing a show titled Stray Cat Crossing with Cat as the titular cat. Through this, we get to relive the events that took place when Cat ran away. Her mom and Benjamin, her dad, were having twins. Cat was scared. She thought mom and Benjamin didn't love her anymore, so she ran away. We learned that from Benjamin is where she got her scarf, the scarf that keeps her warm and safe, just like when she was with her dear old Benjamin, warm and safe. They wanted to move to the city, a place that was always warm, a place without seasons. The fighting between mommy and Benny made Kat very sad, which ultimately led to her decision to run away. The final scene plays much differently, as Kat gets taken back to that very moment it all went down. My god, was her drip so much better back then. That's how you know it was happier times. Also look at the good doggy. Kat has a conversation with someone who got their eyes burned, and it is just now occurring to me while writing the script that this person isn't a cyclops, that's actually their chin and mouth. Not their eye and pupil. What is wrong with me? Flashback to the stage where Benjamin is speeding trying to find Kat. Non-Cyclops person also happens to be looking for a cat, and Cat promises to help. Suddenly, the cat appears and Cat goes to pat that cat. The good boy warns them of the impending doom, and that's when Benjamin, Cat's mom, the non-Cyclops, and the dog all die in a fatal car crash. Well, uh, damn. Normally, I'd pop in here to leave some quirky, light-hearted comment to lift the mood, but this is just sad. Cat fixes the grandfather clock, making it operational once again, and the enthusiastic man appears to her once more. As he puts it, It wasn't your fault, Cat. We don't blame you, Cat. There are millions of daddies in the world. Millions of girls get to have a daddy's love. But only little Cat gets to have Benjamin's love. That's why I want you to call me Benjamin. Cat. Proceeding of what must be the saddest, most heartfelt moment of this entire game is an army of cats. The younger version of Cat. The one that was scared and alone. The one that blames herself for everything. She thinks they blame her. That they hate her for leaving them and causing the accident. But they don't. Despite Kat being all grown up now, the younger version of her that ran away still lives within her. Always remembering the time she ran away and blaming herself for it. Hating herself for it. But through the course of this night, Kat learned that that's not true. And now she can finally put that younger version of herself to rest. Everything here is only a memory. And as you go, you see visions of what could have been if Kat hadn't ran away. 
while Kat wants to go and interact with them, the blind one keeps her focused. She leaves the house, but not before promising to the blind one that she will never forget ever again. And that's it. Roll credits. Throw in the most important representations of the characters, that being the twins, Mom and Benjamin. And to leave a nice traumatic aftertaste, might as well throw in a burning car at the end. For a game that is seldom talked about, Stray Cat Crossing was a beautiful emotional journey, with obvious soul put into it. The art was good, the storytelling was good, and the music was good. The only thing I can fault it for is the puzzles, namely the last one where you're just supposed to loop enough times to get the right items. Anyways, love Stray Cat Crossing, beautiful game. Maybe if we all come together, we can all chip in to get Cat some MF Drip. Oh! Miso! A game made by the same creator that made Mad Father. It starts off with a character select. I chose the female character, Pissballs. Miso is very character driven and has the biggest cast of characters, including Goku, Pissballs, Deku, Teacher Fantasy, Valorant Player, Bitch Tits, Saotomi, Misao, and many more. All of a sudden, the entire school gets sent to Deltarune, and Pissballs gets pushed. We wake up in... What is this, a crossover episode? Ogre, excuse me, Onigawara, wakes up Pissballs and tells her that the school was sucked into another world by the power of Misao's curse. And if that wasn't crazy enough, Aya, fucking Drevis, runs in and has a chat. She will never eat hamburgers ever again. Now it's up to Pissballs to find Misao, dispel the curse, and save everyone. Somehow, almost even more than the witch's house, Misao is brimming with unique ways to meet your end, and death always leads you to this game over screen with this territory war af font. Up in the computer lab, Otomi is getting ditched by Goku. Also, how did... How did she get over there? So Satomi freaking dies. Every time a main character dies, we get a flashback to how that specific character wronged Misao. In this vision, Bitch Tits drops an exposed video on Misao and unintentionally ends up helping her. Misao sends an adorably cheesy love poem to Goku through text and it ends up getting put up on the school bulletin. Misao blaming Satomi. Then we find the Valorant playing teacher in the place every Valorant player should be, stuffed into a locker. Meow for daddy kin. SHUT UP! Goku is whimpering in the bathroom broom closet, and here we learn Pissballs is a total chad who says it how it is at all times. We stand Pissballs. Then the... The toilet. You know, if I just utter the phrase, I get five trillion more views. But at the cost of my dignity... And what am I without my dignity? Goku gets assaulted in the school vape lounge and we learn that PB is unbelievably jacked, effortlessly carrying Goku after he passed out. We then get to name Miss Library. She does respond to her actual name, but we all know the truth. Pissball's name's Ball Piss. PB leaves Goku in BP's room, a room full of homages to Mad Father, complete with books, dolls, Aya's bow, and a literal picture of Aya's mother. Hey, remember how I said BP responds differently to naming her correctly? This is what she says. Yeah, this is Aya Drevis. God, she's so neurodivergent. Miss Teacher Fantasy over here is digging through her teacher's stuff and that's yucky. Later on in the story, no. No Valorant player should be within 20 feet of a school child. What is going on here? Ayaka is in a panicked stupor while Professor Hellokin explains that a demon attacked her. They must have smelled the crushing self-hatred and hideously wretched personality behind the superficial exterior and trembled. The reek of simultaneous self-doubt and god complex when he explained he was Diamond 3 in that strained, fake deep voice surely sent them tripping over themselves. My god. Does it feel good to hate on a game you've never played? Anyways, Ayaka keeps trying to explain the situation to PB, but Kirata keeps parrying her with sound explanations. He suggests we tranquilize Ayaka, and for some reason, PB goes with it, despite Ayaka clearly not being comfortable with the situation and begging for help. Checking back, uh, yeah. Kurata's coveted ultimate estrogen assault was no match for a monster that appeared and killed Ayaka. Ah, damn it, you should have left her with the bat. I failed to protect my kitten. Kurata is also injured, but insists he'll be fine, helping out PB by giving her a bag full of hands. What is this teacher with an aforementioned thing for hands doing with a bag of them? Good question. And if that wasn't suspicious enough, he even says that Misao visited him the day before she went missing. Misao came to him, but he was so busy to interact with her, but he knew she was pained. That's... unfortunate.
The next location our dashing hero finds herself in is the lab, with bitch tits chained to the table. Also look at this guy, isn't he just awesome? Uh oh, I hear a guy with a chainsaw. I wonder what fictional scientist that wields a chainsaw is going to pop through that door. Oh how lovely. Aya's father Alfred Drevs appears all hunched in purple, just like how he appeared in the epilogue scene in the true ending of Mad Father, where Ogre told him he can experiment to his heart's content. PB gets put in the blender and gets turned into a Pikmin and Fortnite dances on bitch tits. Let's go! Anyways, there's a lot of ways to die, including finding this cutie pie in a box and testing to see if there's fall damage. But how you're supposed to survive the average girl sleepover is to open the door to Freddy Fazbear's heart and climb in. When it's all over, PB will be drenched in blood, but will still remind us why she's the best character. Tee <laughs> We then get an incredibly upsetting scene that shows the extent of bitch tits' is bullying, and Jesus Christ, yeah, she deserved everything that came to her. Also, phone jump scare. Yes, this is unironically a game over. Yes, if you didn't save before this point, you'll have to go back. Luckily, you're not the only one who can meet their end via phone because the little mandrake also gets spooked. Such a meme. This game is such a meme. God damn it! God damn it! <laughs> so you can pick them up and serve them up. Unfortunately, we have to clean the blood off, which is pretty unfortunate, but doing so will open Misao's shrine. Then we get serenaded by a ghost that gives us a locked box. Testing the piano ourselves, we find that Pissballs is incredibly talented. Dude! Dude! Pissballs! What a bitch. And the ghost doesn't appreciate being upstaged so royally, so she crushes Pissballs' head. Puzzling happens, we record a mukbang, then we get turned into a burger that Balls Piss eats. We send ahead to the mom dimension and we find even more Mad Fath. One human doll is wearing a dirty blazer that belonged to Misao. Then there's this weird incubation tank containing the male version of PB from the character select screen. What? All this time, while PB was looking to save Misao, Deku was too. Deku was Misao's childhood friend that slowly turned his back to her as they got older. Misao then appears before him and tells him to get bent. It appears though that even after being revenge killed, his soul still wants to save Misao. Even though he can't do that anymore, PB can. So his soul leads her to one of the final pieces of Misao and gives it to her. We then get a vision on how Deku wronged her. And while it is nowhere near as egregious as the others, it hurt seeing someone that was once so close to her not step in to give her a hand. That leaves one final soul to be brought kneeling in front of Misao, and the two potential candidates could be either A, Goku, her boyfriend that seemed to be close with Saotomi at the same time, or B, Mr. She came to me one night and disappeared the next and I have her hands for some reason. You know what I picked. With an enormous grin across her face, PB smashes Karata's skull, which leads to the final cutscene. We bear witness to some of the most upsetting moments of the game, which I'm gonna skip through, hope you don't mind, involving bitch tits being a bitch and teacher being a ch He kept her hands and buried her somewhere on the school grounds. PB then books it to the spot that she saw in her vision and does what she was tasked to do from the beginning. She found Misao. The curse is lifted. You freed Misao. Back in class, Oni Gawara, the demon man, like, he has Oni in his name and does this, come on, of course he's a demon, is gone. The seats that once seated the people that died are now empty, and best of all, the teacher got replaced with this guy that, instead of playing Valorant and using Discord, grills hot dogs on Sundays and has a family of five. Massive win. PB speculates that Misao is finally free from her pain. But before the credits, Misao appears behind Goku. Completing the game gives us truth mode, and like the previous mode, it dives further into the character's actions against Misao. We then wake up in a place that is really similar to the mom dimension, same tiles and everything, which I'll call the Misao dimension. Onigawara explains that you can save everyone from Misao. You just gotta! Doing so will save them and allow them to be reborn. A second chance to be better. Deku is the first and you can see him standing up for Misao in the beginning, but abandoning her later. You're taken to a room full of Misao's that exact revenge in the same way that was done to her. She also calls Deku a virgin, which is probably canon. PB says the most Kingdom Hearts line I've ever seen and it works. She appears and tells Deku that she loves him. How adorable. Next up is Bitch Tits and uh, uh, this sucks. At least it's followed up by one of the most cathartic scenes in the entire game. Chat, how about we just uh, sit here and watch this for a minute? How about... Yeah. Yeah. Isn't that nice? I could go to sleep to this sound. 
All right, she's had enough. Omisa almost certainly disagrees and we get a pretty eerie look from her. PB being the total Chad she is always knows the right thing to say. Like, dude, Pissballs is so emotionally intelligent. She knows that someone can never rest as long as they're holding hate or a grudge against someone else. So she talks to her friend. Torturing those who wronged her in the afterlife would only keep her trapped. And while it may be cathartic for now, she would never truly be free. It'll just turn her into what they were. Saotomi's torture is having to watch Misao kiss Goku in front of Saotomi. Goku likes Misao too much, so Saotomi beats him to death. We also get to see what Valorant Teacher does to Ayaka, basically confirming everything we guess. Up north, we find Misao standing over an unconscious Goku. Pissball says to let him go, and Misao says that all three of us can stay together. Goku then wakes up and tries to run away, but Misao predicted this and installed an invisible treadmill five feet in front of him. The oldest trick in the book. Goku calls Misao a monster and, uh, well, PB shows her reflection in the mirror and yeah, through doing exactly what her abusers did, she too became a monster and she laments over everything, but despite it all, PB, being the Omni-Chad that she is, hugs it out with Misao, Misao's only true friend. We then get the cutest scene where they're holding hands, Misao now being able to truly rest. And then they kissed, hopefully. Pissballs wakes up at her desk in an empty classroom with this written on the chalkboard. Ending on the screen with Misao and Pissballs holding hands and smiling. Absolutely precious. Following this, we get to see the full gallery of this game and Misao's happy at the title screen now, yay! I hope you all enjoyed being traumatized by that game. I sure did. I think the one lesson to take away from this experience is that we should not let any Valorant player diamond two and above within 1,000 feet of a school zone. Now, before I go on to the final game of the video, I'd like to mention that Mad Father is supposedly a prequel to Misao, made by the same developer and everything. There's a decent amount left to cover about both of these games, and a lot of which I don't really have time for in this video. So if you guys would like to see a more in-depth analysis of these two games, then let me know. Next up, we're going to a gallery. One where you yourself can become a work of art. Eeb is much more stylized than any of the other games in this list, starting off with Mommy and Daddy dropping off little Eeb in an art gallery. They let her loose to explore and talk to complete strangers. There's a cool fish, a totally unimportant rose, a gloopy lady, couch, gay tree, that god. Damn, painted woman in red, I hate her so much, and Gary. While not being a listed feature of this exhibit, god damn is he still a work of art, hello mister. Then we Super Mario 64 into the world of Gertena. We dawdle around and find that everyone is mysteriously gone, including mom and dad. This feels familiar. Then little blue shoe prints appear and walk into the big fishy where Eeb leaps in and gets taken to the fabricated gallery. Real cum Eeb moment. We then find a red rose, something Eeb needs to protect in order to stay alive. Eeb does a fantastic job at mixing puzzles and story. The puzzles here are all incredibly unique and memorable. There really is a lot you can do with the premise of being taken to a world of an artist's creation, and that premise is explored almost perfectly. Everything in the fabricated gallery is so surreal, every painting is alive, and every puzzle is very intuitive. Anyways, Eeb explores the fabricated world, bumping into terrible horrors, including a headless mannequin, grabby hands, chompy mouth, and a logic puzzle that Julius Caesar's the dude that gives you the correct answer. Here is an incredibly creative way to warn you that a giant guillotine is coming to come down and chop you in half. Further in, we find that spooky bitch, the lady in red. Her and her counterparts will be somewhat of a recurring character. To progress through, we have to read a book detailing a story where a girl just ate a key. So her friend cut her open and got it. Sometimes, instead of requiring keys, doors will only open if you complete a puzzle. These doors are discernible by the eye shape on them, which opens when the puzzle is complete and you can pass. Eventually, we find that prime choice cut of grizzled man meat we saw up in the gallery here lying face down because he's stupid. Further in, we find a lady in blue, playing he loves me, he loves me not with a blue rose. Probably thinking about those eyes. Probably imagining what it's like to be held in his arms and planning the rest of her life with him. No, this is not projection. Anyway, she gets freaked out by Eeb and starts crawling angrily after Eeb for interrupting her in Fantasyland. 
Painted ladies are like dogs in that they can't open doors. I wonder if it's legal to own one. Then after giving the blue rose some water, we wake up Gary and he says, eek. He starts out wanting to lead the way, but after getting spat at by a painting, he likes to follow this nine-year-old girl instead. I can smell the testosterone. And from here on, you have a friend that you can talk to simply by pressing the Gary button. You'll comment on the current situation and even move things around. That's right, Gary is canonically a power lifter. Make sure if you don't want to have your heart broken at the end of the game, you talk to him often and also remember to keep your Gary safe. He is very dumb. The gray area of the fabricated gallery features a mirror in which Gary strikes a pose. He does work that homeless fit very well. So well that a bald man appears behind him, probably wishing to absorb some of those mythical hair follicles. Gary is spooked and understandably wants to kick the bald man in his shiny round head. I don't blame him. From here we get choices that affect the game. If you let your Gary be a violent little creature, it will add an increment to his doom counter. The doom counter is what happens when you destroy works in the gallery. We'll touch on more of this at the end, so keep watching. Please, please give me watch time. I want to buy my 11th island, you don't understand. Our heroes work their way into a nice rest area that is totally safe. Look, it even has a framed picture of mom and pop. The painted ladies are going ballistic and want to devour you whole, so they set up this maze with the silver painted lady leading the charge. And then, everything's okay. Gary, being the star-studded daddy issues comfort character that he is, carries Eve to safety after she collapses and has a bad nightmare, letting her use his jacket. How thoughtful. This is one of the best scenes to have the two characters bond, and remember, the ending changes based on how close even Gary have gotten, so don't mess this up. A red paint trail leads to another room where we find, wow, another girl. Apparently Mary here was a visitor to the real world art gallery too, and somehow wound up with Eve and Gary. Gary invites her to join, and the trio set off on their journey. Mary with a yellow rose, like Gary's blue and Eve's red rose. We get into a room of adorable bunny rabbits, which freak Gary out for some reason. Inside the green rabbit is a key. What a coincidence. This painting is called Flowers of Jealousy, which forces Eve and Mary from Gary. Why did the painting named Flowers of Jealousy separate Eve and Mary, leaving Gary all alone? We'll figure it out later. Right now I have to go curl up into a ball and sit in the corner knowing that we're leaving Gary behind. Mary doesn't seem too stressed out about it though. We find a palette knife in the box that Mary takes, just in case. Just like Gary, Mary also has a friendship counter that can be increased. This time by pressing the Mary button in every room and being nice to her. Switching back to Gary's perspective, we can see what he saw before. And uh... Okay, yeah, I get it now. Anyways, puzzles, I guess. And Mary asks some pretty weird and personal questions. Putting the pressure on by asking Eve who she would choose if only two people could leave. Here we flip between Gary and Eve's perspectives, each doing puzzles that will help out one another. There's also this little guy that keeps following Gary around, so... That's cool. I feel like every game or every piece of media needs a little guy. There's this painting called Tattletail, which is an epic reference. Then we game. These are some of the best puzzles that I've gone through this week. And considering the last games are all really good puzzle games, I think that speaks volumes of Eve's quality. Gary gets put in the gas chamber, which is <laughs> shocking on a mission to find paintballs. On a search, he discovers a book containing all of Gertana's works the painter of the fabricated world. Each of these paintings we've run into at one point or another, but the most important page of note is this. Mary, the last work of Gertena's life. And sure enough, it's exactly who we think she is. Unfortunately, Gary being that dumb bitch that he is spoke directly into a painting's ear, through which the Tattletale reference informs Mary of her open secret. Mary from then on is completely disturbed, not acting like a normal person would performing open brain surgery on a bald man without anesthesia, and acting weirdly clingy towards Ebe, asking if she can touch Ebe's rose. Doing so will result in a lost petal. So, Ebe can be doing better. Let's check in on Gary. Maybe he's doing better. Surely he's not about to be subjected to one of the most terrifying sequences in any horror media I've ever seen. By far and away, the most iconic sequence in any RPG Maker horror game is Gary in the doll room. Instead of going through and overanalyzing every frame, I think it'll be better if I just showed you my first reaction to this scene. Oh god, I need to find the key to get out. Okay, okay. Eh. Uh, eh. 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 Broken crayon, of course. I should have known. Powder? Nothing? Oh god, that's terrible. Oh god, that's terrible. Oh god, that's terrible. Oh god, that's terrible. Oh good lord, that's terrible. You cut your fingers on something. Okay. Uh-oh. 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 
Bugs. A key, key, key. Gary? Yeah, this scene is legendary for a reason. What happened to him? We'll find out when I go over the endings. But for now, in this video, Gary lives on. Upon successful completion of the doll room, Gary sprints out and falls against the wall on the very far side of the room, having no doubt just gone through the most traumatic experience in his life. But despite all that, all he can think about is keeping Ebe safe. His selflessness, despite it all, proves once again why Gary is the best. Just in time, Gary pulls through as Mary starts threatening Ebe. Ebe, being a frightened child, gives Gary a big hug, which is something that I have no doubt we all want to do after all we've gone through. Then we get to the most surreal portion of the game, the sketchbook. This is, without a doubt, the most unique section out of any of the games we've covered thus far. A place of Mary's creation, featuring nine areas with Mary patrolling through with her palette knife. If I had to take a guess, she is none too pleased. Culminating in her nothing personnel kid attitude, and pushing both you and Gary into her toy box. This place is full of awful things, each of these things being things you've seen earlier in your journey. Be it the clown painting, the bald man, or that awesome turtle dude, big fan of that guy. Gary wakes up and immediately checks to see if Eve is okay, and everyone freaks out, leading us back upstairs, where Gary burns the yellow roses leading us back to the room with a painting. Mary's painting. Mary makes an appearance, activates her true power, then we rush over to burn her painting which explodes into flames, injuring Gary. With that resolves, you talk to Gary and get the option to offer him your handkerchief to use as bandaging. Depending on how close Eve and Gary are in your playthrough, you will either accept it or refuse, locking you into an ending. From there, you can make your way into a red variation of the fabricated gallery, where you get the option to escape. But just before you cross back over, Eve's mother makes a surprise appearance from the fabricated gallery and tells Eve that they're leaving. So, it's a choice. Do you leave with your mother or do you leave with Gary? Here's a quick reminder though, your mom is a lady in a red dress, we hate those. Gary has done nothing but look out for Eve from the very beginning, and with his hand Gary pulls Eve back safe into the real world. You're back in the gallery, everybody is there including Gary who's downstairs, pondering at the red rose statue. If you didn't bond with him and get him to take the handkerchief, he will walk away from Eve, the two of them not remembering their shared struggle, and forgetting entirely, resulting in the memory's crannies ending. But if Gary and Eve grew close in the fabricated world, and Gary accepted the handkerchief, it will all come flooding back to both of them. Gary decides to keep the handkerchief, but promises to one day return it to her. They go their separate ways with a promise for reunion. Wow. What fun characters. Let's see what happens to them if they didn't make it out. If Eve chooses to go with her fake mother, or if Gary happens to get axed earlier in the story and fake Gary comes back, and you choose to go with either of them, you'll get Eve all alone. You can also get this ending by doing a bunch of the remake content and taking a little nappy poo in this weird modern art equivalent diamond shaped bed that gives Eve a flashback to when she got her handkerchief. If Gary is with you, he does the proper caretaker thing to do and not let you fall asleep in it. If Gary was a feisty little rascal in your playthrough, chances are his doom counter is pretty high. And what else would the doom counter do besides make our beloved Gary die? When pushed into the toy box, Gary will instead wake up Ebe. Ebe lost her rose. Luckily it's in good hands. Oh wait, no it isn't. Mary bargains for Gary's blue rose, Gary taking the deal, promising Ebe that they'll run to get it back. When leaving the toy box, we can hear someone playing Loves Me Loves Me Not, Gary feeling a little sluggish. Gary does the absolute best he can to explain to Eve that he can't go on, in a way that doesn't frighten the nine-year-old Eve, which is so heartbreaking. Upstairs we can see Mary finishing up her game of Loves Me Loves Me Not with a blue rose, tossing the colorless stem to the floor. Going back down we find Gary slumped over in the corner, sleeping, and we have the chance to borrow his lighter. We have two paths ahead of us. Take the lighter and burn Mary's portrait, or just go straight for the exit. Burning Mary's painting will kill Mary, leaving Eve to escape the fabricated world, being the only living thing to inhabit it at that point. Gary will reappear at the very end to try and get Eve to find another exit, but don't be tricked. Gary 
is dead. This is a hallucination Eve made up, similar to how she made up her mom when Gary was on the other side of the portrait. If I had to guess, the fabricated gallery uses a fake version of the person someone trusts the most to try and lure them away from the exit. Back on the other side, the gallery will be just as you left it, only this time a familiar looking portrait is hanging, depicting a sleeping man. Yeah, sleeping. It is pretty dark to think about how Eve's caretaker throughout the course of the game has his corpse immortalized in painting form. The worst part is that Eve can't even remember Gary. No one can. The only thing that suggests he ever existed at all is his one forgotten painting. I mean portrait. Fiddlesticks. Alternatively, if you exit without borrowing Gary's lighter, you can leave the fabricated world of Mary following you out. Mary is now a part of Eve's family, finally getting to experience what it's like to have a mom and dad. Even though at the cost of a living soul, at least the two seem happy as sisters. Side note, I love how Mary's shadow is a mess of black scribbles while Eve has an actual shadow. Just a nice subtle reminder of Mary's true origins. Now what exactly happens when the giant red-eyed abomination catches Gary? Eve and Mary head to the doll room to find Gary sat on the floor, talking to himself. Eve is worried about Gary and elects to stay with him, curling up into a ball in front of him. Yeah, it's sometimes hard to forget that you're playing as a nine-year-old girl. And out of any of the protagonists we've seen so far, Eve is probably the most realistic with how she responds to things like her caretaker being effectively lobotomized. Instead of getting up and leaving with Mary, she stays curled up by Gary to the moment she dies. Mary, you fool! You never should have invited the painted ladies to the function. Mary talks to them like they're still alive, and we get the ending, Welcome to the World of Gertena. Now, if you didn't interact much with Mary prior to this, she'll attempt to leave by herself, letting you play as Mary. She even gets her own unique menu, which I actually adore. It's like she uses her crayons to make sure everything about her is like Ebe. Eventually, she makes it out of the fabricated world, but not into the real world. It seems that without anyone else with her, Mary gets lost in a weird limbo that isn't her world or the real world. Unable to leave, she gets increasingly unstable, the rose sculpture even outright telling her that her heart is fabricated. She finds a poster of herself collapsed, the lights continue to dim, and in the end, she was just like Eve, a scared and lost child begging for help. Certified come Mary moment. And with the painting's demise ending, we reach the end of Eve, and by extension, the end of this video. From my parting thoughts, I think the game that left the biggest impression on me had to be either Eve or Mad Father. To put it simply, these two games are some of the best this genre has to offer, and if I'd choose between the two, I'm gonna have to weigh slightly in favor of Mad Father. What can I say? It left quite the impression. My name's Pake Pake. Thank you for. and make sure to smash